So, start with you obligatory uh, marketing talk. So <laughs> uh, we're from BMW Car IT. So we're the uh, software or doing basically embedded software for in-car uh, ECU. So really, let's say software running in your vehicles uh, for BMW uh, for the last 10 years. Um, we have a kind of small office of 250 people in Ulm uh, where we do software for a bunch of different ECUs, uh, but mostly focused around infotainment, uh, body domain, and autonomous driving. Um, I'm Brendan LaFolle. I'm part of the uh, architecture team in, uh, in Ulm, where we specialize in um, the Linux platform development um, for our ECUs. Uh, so my responsibility is the, the in-house um, Linux-based uh, software development platform. And uh, our general, let's say, aim is to develop uh, reusable software um, for basically in-house ECUs to have basically reusable software across ECU generations rather than essentially starting um, every time from scratch. So that's generally, let's say, our, our, our picture. Um, so I think a quick recap, probably it's really obvious for people in the automotive industry, but um, we have a lot of ECUs with software in a, in a current vehicle. Um, so there's actually a real picture from a new 7 Series showing you kind of all the large ECUs uh, and the general placement. Um, so what we're really targeting for, for some of these ECUs now is um, our general um, Linux distribution that we call internally Node 0. Um, this is actually a pretty, I would say, standard uh, big Linux embedded distribution. So it's, it's Yocto Linux base, it's system glibc, it's nothing uh, extraordinary. I think one of the big things we're doing essentially, um, we want to have integrity protection for basically absolutely every, ex every executable we run. Um, and obviously using uh, hardware mechanisms for security, hardware key stores, this kind of thing. Um, and one of our main goals is we're trying to avoid delegating uh, early tasks to microcontrollers or to things that would then require a handover to Linux. So we're really trying to essentially run everything within one OS rather than essentially handing over certain functionalities or let's say uh, having multiple systems to maintain. So we're trying to say, keep things simple. Um, and the last point is a bit inflammatory, so it's, um, we don't actually really boot that fast. Um, it's just that we provide the ability uh, to run early tasks and to actually run certain parts of our stack very early. So it's not like everything is running really fast. I think um, we're not doing anything magical that everyone else is not being able to do. <laughs> um, but we, we basically just have a system designed so we can run and order tasks in a, in a kind of interesting way. Um, and lastly, um, this is really kind of coming from the product side. So actually, um, we're really shipping basically this platform now in four ECUs in 2022. And I just want to kind of give you an impression of the amount of ECUs that we're really targeting basically now and in the future um, with, our, with our Linux platform. So you can really see it's kind of, let's say, growing pretty fast. Um, and lastly, it's, it's really, let's say, we're, we're focusing our design on, let's say, Audisar or Adaptive Audisar free, so we don't have any of this in our, in our ECUs. Um, so a little bit more of automotive stuff. So I mean, um, I think everyone <laughs> maybe knows. Uh, some people might know why we need to boot fast, but I think there's a lot of generic reasons. Typically, the answer is that the NHSTA has a requirement that the rear view camera must be displayed within two seconds. A bit unclear exactly when the two seconds starts, uh, when it stops. Uh, <laughs> but um, and different manufacturers do it differently. Uh, I heard from one manufacturer they take five, uh, but <laughs> I'm not here to judge. Uh, uh, essentially, um, there's actually lots of extra reasons why we want to boot fast. I mean, I think this rear view camera is just a typical use case and it has a legal behind it, but actually, um, I usually take the example of um, if I'm on a motorbike and I get on the motorbike and I press the start button or I turn my key, I want the system to come up pretty fast. Uh, and I think this is a probably more reasonable thing to imagine. Um, or something like when you open the door and you have some projector showing you some lights or something. Um, the more we're putting Linux into basically more complex systems or to systems which are even not, let's say, relegated to infotainment, you need to basically have, let's say, a, a, quick, uh, a quick boot up time for some of the, some of the infrastructure which was typically done by, by real time systems. Um, so I think just to give a quick idea of what we currently boot really fast in our systems and what, what the kind of use cases are to give people kind of an idea, here's the kind of current high-end cockpit of a, um, I think it's an i20, um, but basically things like the inference cluster, um, the driver camera system, um, the early video use case, ignore the fact it's showing a Navi, uh, and, a, and a head up, 
this is typically what, what we basically need to show the customer relatively fast uh, when he's getting into his vehicle. Um, and I mean, a customer of a vehicle is not like a smartphone customer. He's expecting this to kind of work relatively fast. Um, so yeah, I think it's a bit different to, to other use cases. Now I wanted to qualify a little bit what we meant by modern security. Um, initially it was decent security, but I was told that's not very good. Uh, so it's now modern. Uh, <laughs> but generally uh, what we want to try and achieve is integrity protection for all executables. Um, this is really basically um, not just for, I would say, pure uh, hackability of our system, but actually it's really practical to know that the software that we signed is what we're shipping to our customers. It's actually super important and that no one's tampered with it on the way there. Um, we also want to basically use um, modern secure key storage mechanism. So this is um, typically to protect our backend access for authentication of the ECU and especially preventing physical theft. And one thing which is quite important to us is that we don't want basically our cars being taken apart by someone and then sold in the black market. Uh, it's also raising people's insurance costs. So um, basically how do we basically lock down our ECUs to the vehicle? Um, and obviously we have modern use cases, so we want some DRM keys for providing some nice content to, to customers. Um, on top of this, uh, we also want, let's say, mandatory access control. Um, so we're using SE Linux on our ECUs. Um, we also want to have IPC security policies. So essentially we want IPC to be, um, yeah, essentially have access control and security policies around it. Um, we're using Ethernet a lot in our vehicles, so more and more um, you'll see um, 100 meg gigabit Ethernet in our, in our vehicles. Uh, and we want to be able to somehow pair uh, the ECUs again so that the communication between them is secure. Um, we're using basically IPsec currently for this. Uh, encrypting customer data, I think this is pretty obvious. Um, and the general, let's say, things that you should do in an embedded system, so not running binary the root, having minimal privileges for, for binaries which would require certain things. Um, and I think it's, let's say, pretty obvious these days that with things like UNEC R155, you need to be a bit more serious with this stuff and we need to document how we're doing this. And I think this is, let's say, quickly becoming pretty custom and, and standard practices in the industry. Um, so let's get booting. Um, so I think the first thing uh, is just to avoid doing it, basically. I mean, uh, cheating is, is way, way easier than booting really fast. Uh, it's really, really hard to get into a car in under three seconds. I mean, the motorbike example I gave is, is a kind of, a, let's say, a bit of a hack around this. It's really hard to get in a car in three seconds. Um, also, what we're doing a lot is using suspender RAM. Um, so STR is kind of interesting. Um, it's not necessarily as fast as you would initially think so. Uh, it's actually quite surprising when you open a laptop lid, it's not even that fast. Uh, and it's kind of similar uh, on, on ECUs. Um, it's obviously pretty fast and let's say it's taking, I would say, around one second on, on average to get basically everything back up in a, in a kind of working order on our, on our systems. Um, the problem being that, let's say, uh, it's still essentially relatively slow and you still need to optimize um, your, your hard boot to cold boot times anyway, because anyway, your requirement is to boot in cold boot. So it doesn't really matter if you can only do your requirement in STR, you also need to do it in, in, in cold boot. Um, you also basically can't always use STR to basically protect the battery. So even an electric vehicle is still a problem. Um, you can't basically always rely on the battery as a customer will go on holiday for like four weeks or keep his car in a garage for like two months. Uh, and it's, yeah, it still needs to start relatively fast. Um, so it's kind of giving you double work. The big advantage of STR though, is that you can have your whole application stack started really fast. So the whole thing is looking really good, not just your early use case. And I think that's really highlighted by the fact that actually I'm giving you a real number here. So there's really in, in a current ECU, we have about this situation. Um, we're basically only, let's say, getting our real early KPI down by about 500 milliseconds by using suspender RAM. Uh, and that's because you need to wait for basically the network to be back up, the camera to be back up, all of this. And this actually takes quite a bit of time. So STR isn't necessarily saving um, everything. Also, um, a lot of our MSOC vendors just don't really support STR or do it really badly. Um, so this is pretty painful. Um, and lastly, and one way to avoid it is hibernation. I think it's, it's pretty interesting, uh, but generally, um, flashes are still not that fast um, and it's pretty difficult to guarantee a lifetime of over 15 years uh, when you basically have um, this kind of ride cycles which would basically allow you to do hibernation. 
So at least we're not really managing to do this yet. Um, yeah, could be interesting for you in your use case though. Um, so you really want to. So, <laughs> uh, so generally, uh, what are the high level issues? So at least the ones I kind of wanted to go through with you guys today. Um, a few kind of highlights that we found that I think are kind of generic enough to share, to share with everyone and maybe, maybe help people. Um, one of the first things I added is basically how we do our AB updates and partitioning of our system. Um, partly because I thought I read a talk about optimizing boot flows and it was talking about how AB updates were making you slower and I was kind of confused, so I thought I would add something. Uh, um, secondly, basically our integrity checks, a little bit about how we basically load the kernel, a um, little bit about how we do, we do init and udev, uh, and then some, let's say, generic security things. Um, and it's not entirely in order. Uh, <laughs> so I structured it, let's say, uh, in a kind of before uh, Linux boots, after Linux boot and user space. Um, but let's have a quick look at kind of, let's say, how you get a rough timeline of your, your high level things. Um, so I think this is basically a relatively achievable boot sequence. It's the numbers are a little bit wrong, but it's, it's generally basically what we kind of target in a, let's say, modern system. Um, it's generally what we also see. Um, so we're seeing basically a first user space achievable in about one second um, with basically all security enabled, um, including the power stabilization phase. So this is really basically when the power goes into the ECU, so the famous 12 volt rail, which is not 12 volts. Um, and uh, yeah, typically we have a first stage and second stage bootloader and at some point the kernel is booted after this and we, we end up in roughly the second range. Um, and then we have to start orchestrating and starting the other things. The first thing which is kind of, yeah, relatively interesting is secure boot these days is not really that slow. So um, we even have some vendors telling us that it's not even slower than not doing it. Um, not really too sure. Maybe they don't want to support not doing it. It's typically mandated anyway if you want to use Trust Zone or if you want to use some of the hardware security features, so you're kind of forced to do it anyways. Um, one of the other interesting things though is that um, actually changing your key size to basically a smaller key typically doesn't net you quite as much performance as you might expect. Um, these hardware accelerators are kind of fast. Um, we had one use case where we benchmarked, so I thought it was interesting to give some kind of real numbers. We benchmark basically moving from 2K keys to 4K keys, and this added about 40 millisecond. Um, so it's, let's say, you have to decide whether this is good for your use case or not, but it's, it's generally pretty cheap. Um, it's also relatively cheap to do a secure boot on your uh, extra microcontrollers around your platform, which is kind of interesting <laughs> as an aside. Um, I personally thought that would be kind of a no-no, but it seems it's working really well these days. So um, we're also able to do secure boot on, let's say, other peripherals around us, which is, which is quite nice. I think the next part is that um, our modern managed flashes, so EMMCs and UFSs, are actually really, really fast nowadays. Um, so I think um, <laughs> we were talking about it earlier and somewhere around 10 times faster than what we had, let's say, uh, a few years ago. Uh, I don't know if that's really true, but it's, it's for sure super fast. So these EMMCs um, in uh, HS400 mode and uh, these UFS uh, 2.1 and above are really, really fast. And um, what's kind of interesting is how they're kind of generally mapped uh, these days. So this is more, let's say, a more complex UFS type mapping, but generally um, the way they're typically organized in your BSP is you have, let's say, a certain section of flash, which is essentially uh, sectioned off and typically marked as this enhanced memory type 2. This is how the JEDEC spec calls it. But generally this just means that the, let's say, flash vendor has different segments of his flash which he considers different quality. And depending on how your vendor is doing this, uh, this could be quite good or it could be not that great. Uh, but typically your, the BSP vendor will put basically all of his bootloaders in this enhanced memory type 2 region to try and be a little bit faster. So typically it's using SLC cache to basically that's segregated off into this, uh, this region. Um, however, in quite a lot of cases now, it's basically the same multi-layered stuff, but in pseudo SLC mode, uh, but it's still a tiny bit faster and maybe a little bit more reliable to put your bootloaders in there. Um, some vendors are even putting the kernels in there and everything, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, this section is typically about 100, under 100 meg for both. And typically we have two because we basically have an, an A and B side uh, with some kind of partitions inside there. 
Um, and obviously then you have, let's say, past this section, uh, rest of the lungs, which are typically then segregated into, let's say, either your level two bootloaders or your kernel or just your root file system or let's say your other files. Um, but the really interesting thing is that the kernel and how it deals with basically um, how to label these, these modern flashes. So the kernel would typically create your block device for every single segment of this flash. So this means that even with one UFS, and this is also the case in, in Android phones, um, you'll actually end up with something like seven block devices, uh, which look like seven independent um, partitions or partition tables. Um, and this presents a kind of interesting problem because um, UDEV, is, as we'll see a little bit, is kind of slow, and this gives you lots of events already. Um, and also, because these block devices are not necessarily enumerated in the same way at every boot, this can give you some interesting randomness, uh, especially if you change your FS vendor or if you do something else. Uh, so one of the things that we're trying to do is essentially try and minimize the randomness of this by pre-allocating block devices to certain devices that we expect. Uh, and we also uh, essentially limit uh, the amount of block devices that we are basically allowed to pass by the kernel. Um, kind of very simple patches, but it's a nice way to essentially get you to be uh, not so random. And typically in our ECUs, um, we don't get hardware that we didn't expect the first time around. Uh, so this is, let's say, super ungeneric and not a very nice solution, but it's really practical um, to try and basically limit uh, the problems you can have. Um, I think we only have really one use case where we have, let's say, devices where people can plug in. I mean, we have a USB port, so clearly you can get an extra device in. Uh, but this is typically done way, way later and doesn't affect the, the early boot flow. Um, it's, it's actually really a good gain. I mean, we gain something like 300 millisecond by basically pre-allocating uh, our, our early block devices. Uh, but it is true that, let's say, depending on your BSP vendor and how much they're abusing this kind of layout, um, you can have really a lot of partitions with their default BSPs. Um, there is one vendor out there that will give you nearly 100 partitions in the default BSP. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> this is a little bit crazy, but um, this seems to be how people are structuring things nowadays. Um, so I promised it. I mean, um, basically AB partitioning, how we're roughly doing it. I mean, this is a little bit special depending on your SOC vendor. And I think SOC, some SOC vendors are really much simpler than others. Um, I think TI had an interesting presentation um, showing how flexible they are. I would argue that it's just really complicated. Uh, but um, generally, um, the way that these modern flashes make it really simple, if you don't have a NOR spy for early boot, um, which doesn't really gain you all that much these days, uh, is you basically have a register that tells you which working lung to go for. So what you can basically do in your, in your ROM is just check what this register is. As soon as you know which basically boot run to go for, then you start basically this bootloader and this becomes your boot partition. Um, the really nice thing is that this boot ROM is baked into the SSC and nearly all modern SSCs support this type of AB layout because it's essentially exactly what Android does. Uh, or at least what Android does if you, let's say, uh, in certain vendors. But it's, it's typically really, let's say, really supported by these boot ROMs that they basically check this register and then choose what they, what they will do based on exactly this, uh, this information. And they don't go through some persistency on the North Spy or something like this. So it's essentially really nice because it can't really be corrupted. Um, and especially in development, it's really nice because you just can't screw this up. Um, Obviously, the downside is that all your recovery and, let's say, mechanisms, what, what do you do when you didn't manage to boot this first LAN, things like this, you're basically locked into what the ROM code allows you to do. So, obviously, you can't update this. So, your recovery strategy from a completely failed boot is a little bit, let's say, locked down to your vendor. Um, and obviously, it's not really secure on its own, right? Um, you still need to, let's say, figure out how you're going to do your... Um, um, uh, your rollback protection, things like this, this doesn't really, not a solution on its own, but it's, it's kind of a nice way to do um, AB partitioning in a, in a really simple way. Um, so then uh, we get to uh, maybe some of the funnier parts. So one of our main strategies for the kernel is um, to essentially modularize everything we can. So I mean, this is pretty basic. If you want to go faster, load less. Um, so we try and basically get our kernel down to as small as possible and then have basically modules loaded for all the functionality that we absolutely need really early and then try and load the kernel modules for things that we don't need so early later. I think it's pretty basic. 
Um, we also have ECUs with a relatively large amount of RAM now, so we actually see it's beneficial to actually hot plug RAM, um, so to start with less and then add the, the rest later, uh, which I always think is quite funny. Uh, but the kernel's really good at this, it's able to do this really nicely. Um, uh, one of the things which I think is the most interesting is actually the scheduler during the boot up sequence. Um, this actually makes quite a large difference, um, but it's really difficult to get a recommendation that's basically applicable to everyone's ECUs or everyone's system. Um, but I think the nice thing with these embedded systems is that you always boot in the same way because it's always the same system uh, and you only need to test your system, not someone else's. So it's relatively simple to just play with it a little bit to have a look at what you can get. Um, especially if you have a architecture which is essentially a, a, a big little or even worse, a fat big little, uh, where you essentially have multiple cores of different, let's say, performance. Um, the two big schedulers that at least we benchmarked is, is Wharton Pelt and generally the, uh, the big, let's say, difference philosophically is whether you want to essentially uh, prioritize core migrations to your large cores and execute there or whether you basically want to keep um, uh, your load basically spread across your cores and not basically migrate around. I think that's generally the high level difference. So one is basically giving you more core migrations and higher scheduling latencies, um, uh, whilst the other is essentially um, giving you less of this, but on the flip side has slightly less aggressive frequency ramp up. Um, so it's some tasks may be a little bit slower. So you really have to kind of have a look at what, what you can gain. Um, I can at least tell you for one use case that we basically ended up choosing Pelt. And this gave us something around 20 millisecond gain on the display driver starting. Um, and we gained overall on, let's say, the full system startup around 200 millisecond. Um, but this basically the full system startup for the, for the real platform, right? So then when you consider, let's say, everything the containers are starting afterwards and really your full system ready thing, we gain actually nearly half a second. Uh, so this is kind of interesting for essentially something that's pretty much free. Uh, <laughs> um, the other thing is basically if you prioritize the latencies for, for some processes, um, yeah, you really have to go have a look in your use case and what your, what your microarchitecture is like, uh, but this can gain you some, some interesting things. Um, so we talked a little bit about how we basically want to um, do integrity checking for our whole system. Um, I think that's one of the, the real big, I would say, new things that we've really introduced um, with this kind of generations of our ECUs. Um, where we're essentially copying exactly what Android is doing, uh, but putting that on Linux. So one of the uh, big things we wanted to do is to use essentially um, integrity protection for all the binaries that we're executing. So all of our uh, read write partitions are basically no exec, so we have no binaries on there. Um, and generally we ended up with DM Verity, um, which is working really quite nicely and we're using it um, essentially without an init RD, which is exactly how Android is doing it. Uh, in order to do this, you basically need some kind of bootloader which is understanding a little bit your, your, um, uh, your structure. Um, the nice thing is, is that the ABB2 format from Google um, is available and most bootloaders are basically supporting this. Uh, so again, we're kind of using the fact that Android is so pervasive in this market that this technology is available relatively easily. Um, and we found that in practice, it's, it's really much faster than IMA. And we don't require the use of an init RD, which I don't have a good number for, but we think is, is a, a good way to save a bit of time. Um, DM Verity also provides us some interesting error correction capabilities, uh, where we do have some forward error, correct, uh, error correction inside uh, the VB meta partition. Uh, and so we're, we're able to basically, yeah, correct possibly a few bit flips if we had them. So it's actually giving you some extra reliability. Uh, and obviously you don't need to do any FS checks or whatever because you never touch the partition. Um, so it's kind of nice. It also allows you to skip uh, kernel module signing. So if you use the Inverity and you use load pin correctly, um, you are essentially able to say that, well, all my kernel modules are on a partition which has the Inverity. Load pin essentially blocks the, the kernel from using modules from um, any partition outside of the first one it's loaded. So typically your root file system. Um, and it's also guaranteeing all firmwares loaded by uh, the kernel will also be from that partition. So it's really nice because actually then you don't need to do any extra signature sign, uh, checks um, after this. 
And of course, because DM Verity is doing, let's say, um, on-demand uh, checks, it's not like checking the entire partition and then loading it, um, you're not really slowed down if you have any kernel modules, which basically you're not going to load until forever. Um, you don't have to do the checks, let's say, in advance. So this is really nice, obviously with the restriction that it, you can't load things from outside your, your first partition, but this is a pretty easy restriction, I think, to deal with. Um, on to more fun security things. Um, so Trustone has many issues. I'm not sure why I put the issue, but um, generally um, TAs are like super uh, dependent on your BSP and, and how it's kind of structured. Here we're talking about one vendor in particular. Uh, I'll let you guess. Um, uh, the, the big problem basically with accessing TrustZone is that you can only do this through uh, a user space application to actually communicate with the, uh, the trusted world, uh, or the secure world as they call it. So it's actually not really possible uh, <laughs> to, during your boot up process of your kernel, you need to start a bunch of stuff until you start the arbitration daemon, and then you can communicate with the secure world. And the problem with this is that the arbitration daemons typically are written and expect lots of things to already be started. <laughs> and if you start relying on them for doing, let's say, very early things, like you want to start your persistency that's read write that's using a TA to get the key or something, then you're basically kind of blocked until Trust Zone has really started before you can do things. And this is typically pretty slow. Um, and um, let's say that the more you're basically using via Trust Zone in your, in your early, the more you need this arbitration daemon to be up really fast. And typically, um, Trust zone itself or the TAs are pretty fast to load and they're typically relatively well parallelized even though they do steal your CPU cycles during the boot up, but just typically relatively cheap still. The problem is really this arbitration daemon that's starting and it's really difficult to basically get this, um, yeah, loaded in a fast way, which is really, really transparent with the rest of your user space. Um, I think one thing that we're really looking forward to and it'd be really interesting to see if um, we managed to, let's say, get into this kind of world is things like ARM system ready, uh, which is basically kind of, let's say, uh, specifying how basically an ARM SOC should kind of boot and, and how the boot flow should kind of work. And this would really help us standardize basically what, um, what you're allowed to do in this EL1 and EL2 modes um, and where the, let's say, secure world really starts. Um, so I think this is uh, one of the things that we'd be yeah, really interested in the future to see if we can yeah, get some good um, some good improvements there. And I think just to give you an idea, typically, I mean, on this kind of product, um, we're talking about yeah, nearly 150 milliseconds just to start um, the uh, uh, Trust Zone, let's say, application images and the hypervisor to actually run the Trust Zone applications inside. Uh, and then the Trust Zone arbitration daemon is starting even later. Um, so it's basically really, really slow for us to use this. Now, some of the maybe more, more funny parts that we do. So um, let's say once we're, let's say, outside of the kernel and in well into user space, uh, we're using systemd. Uh, and systemd is, is really, really nice and really pretty flexible and it lets us do some, some really interesting things. Um, but one of the things basically we try and do is start things in what we call the early target. Um, and essentially, what we define as an early target, which allows us to run things before UDEV enumeration has really started and before essentially the sysinit target is up. Um, and that allows basically us to reach boot times that um, are pretty good because we can basically start some user space stuff um, before basically systemd would typically allow you to run things. Um, obviously, um, every application that you start in this, <laughs> in this early target of ours um, needs to have really minimal dependencies and you'd be really careful about what you add in there. You can make crazy things. Um, and just to give you a kind of example of, of what we kind of start um, in this early target, uh, we're talking about things like um, DBus, um, some systemd network D services, um, our runtime variants. So typically our ECUs are using a kind of concept of one image for multiple variants. And essentially one of the first things we want to find out is what ECU is this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, or let's say, um, yeah, some basic information of what this exact hardware variant is and what we should do about it. Um, communication to basically your I.O. controller, so you probably have some, some white controller that does some low-level stuff um, where we need to kind of communicate with. Um, 
we're using some IP to communicate to our other ECUs, so we need to start this pretty early to, to, to kind of do most things. And then some general network management and let's say startup uh, devices, which are let's say, a little bit custom to us. But generally just to give you a kind of idea of what you need to start. And then let's say the system for us is, I would say, partly functional um, for, for some applications. Um, and after this, we're basically then resuming the normal kind of startup of system D and allowing it to basically follow its really nice kind of ordering. Um, and this is really kind of flexible. We have some kind of special boot modes for basically our kind of general targets, which are basically yeah, application flashing and basically remote software update targets, um, which we basically use to, to organize our startup, let's say, as you would basically in a normal system D system. Nothing, nothing too crazy. Um, so we kind of alluded to it before, but UDEV is, um, is really noisy. Uh, and actually slows us down um, a fair amount in this, in this early startup phase. Um, we obviously really like to use UDEV. It's not like uh, we try and avoid this on, on real purpose. That's why we, we still uh, use it. But the um, events are replayed in an in order which is not fully uh, predictable. Um, and the um, filtering of certain subsystems uh, or the prioritizing of it um, basically is really tricky. Uh, it's also um, yeah, really difficult to kind of stop uh, UDEV triggering events and then having them re-trigger them or re-triggering events that you've already seen um, to basically avoid too much noise. Um, it's kind of really difficult to, um, to get this working. And um, we have a kind of number of pull requests that we, we try to push towards system D to try and yeah, make it a little bit more configurable, basically which events we wanted to see and how we could re-trigger certain events. Um, and I think the problem is always that it's not very generic. And I mean, it's totally true. <laughs> uh, it's um, our, uh, uh, our patches typically try and essentially, um, yeah, configuring for a certain target where you really know what's gonna happen and what events you're expecting. Uh, and it's really difficult to essentially have a super generic way of configuring things. So I think currently we're on like V2 of the patch sets, uh, which, yeah, I think it's still not going in. Uh, so it's, yeah, I think it's really difficult to kind of get a good compromise between something which is really configurable and generic for any kind of system and something which is, let's say, um, yeah, really, let's say, um, uh, fast. Uh, I think uh, there's been some improvements in, um, in filtering for subsystems, but it's still quite a bit slower than what we currently have. So we're losing something like 100, 200 milliseconds basically on, on UDEV um, in this really early stage, which is kind of, yeah, at the stage we're at, we really want to gain basically hundreds of milliseconds because uh, it's quite a lot of time. Um, the next big offender that we have in our user space um, is the um, Polkit is really, really big. Uh, it's uh, using JavaScript for its configuration uh, and it has loads of cool features and you can do loads of crazy stuff with it. Um, uh, but it's like over 50 megs uh, and uh, it's... Um, yeah, pretty difficult to avoid it. I mean, obviously we're using Dbus because we're using systemd and for other things. Um, so we want to have basically some way of um, uh, having a secure IPC around it and then say, making sure that not everyone can call everything on, on Dbus. I mean, that's clearly a bad idea. Um, but we really basically struggle with, with Polkit. So we, we tried to uh, use these recent patches to replace MOSJS with duct tape. Uh, which is actually really nice. I mean, this is replacing, yeah, most JS thing is like 40 something megs currently, 47. Uh, and duct tape is something like 300 kilobytes. I mean, it's a pretty big gain uh, already. Uh, but you're still passing basically a JavaScript configuration file and this is pretty still slow. Uh, and especially on smaller ECUs, um, we basically were really struggling and we're losing nearly one second basically in Polkit startup. And this typically then blocks us for everything which is using systemd because if you have some kind of, let's say, small, small thing that needs to basically figure out if services started or you want to basically do anything on Dbus and with systemd that you don't run as root, you're basically waiting for Polkit. Um, so we really kind of struggled to see how we can make this work. And in the end, uh, we came up with um, making our own. Um, so uh, it's not quite ready, but we will basically be opening, uh, open sourcing this later. Um, basically, we um, wrote a small uh, Polkit replacement daemon uh, called Smallkit. Um, it's pretty much inspired by the old Ostra project group check. So essentially, it's a um, 
yeah, kind of one-to-one -one replacement of PolKit, but with a lot less features and supporting a lot less configuration and yeah, it's a bunch of missing stuff. Um, and our plan is to basically provide this as a virtual provider for PolKit in Yocto. So it's basically a complete drop-in uh, replacement for PolKit. Um, and at least, yeah, in our experience, basically, if you want to do anything with systemd, this nets you basically nearly one second uh, for, um, yeah, before you can basically use dbus. So it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, and lastly, um, yeah, one of the things we're doing a lot is um, containers. I mean, I think like everyone in this conference is doing, we, we're also trying to, let's say, containerize our world and applications. Uh, and I think one thing I wanted to kind of highlight is um, we, um, we wanted to basically have a look at, let's say, which container framework we should be using. So we were using LXC, but we thought maybe we should be a little bit more modern and, and try and some nice new things that people are using. And uh, so actually we, um, we, we had some benchmarks done to try and figure out, let's say, um, uh, yeah, what, what could be basically another modern framework that we could use that could basically get us some nice features, some kind of overlays, this kind of stuff, and, uh, and how it would work basically on our embedded ECUs. Um, and the results are kind of pretty clear. Um, we really can't use anything but what we currently had because everything else was really, really, really slow. Um, and um, yeah, one of the things we kind of, let's say, see is that a lot of these container frameworks, things like this, are, are really not, let's say, um, optimizing for the kind of boot times that we want. It's clearly, let's say, very different applications they have in mind. Um, and uh, it's essentially, yeah, pretty difficult for, <laughs> for us to move away from essentially very basic namespacing setups um, with basically a pretty low level daemon, which is, let's say, pretty small. Um, and all of this overlay FS and kind of fancy um, uh, orchestration stuff is just, yeah, way, way too slow on, on small hardware. Um, so that's a bit of a sad thing. Um, I think we kind of, let's say, would like to see if we could kind of think of a container framework, which is a little bit, let's say, lighter, uh, but a little bit more fully featured than basically what we're currently doing. Uh, but currently, I would say we're, we're really not there. Um, so I think it's basically all I, all I really want to talk about today and all we really had. I think one of the things we're really interested in is basically um, who else has this problem. Uh, so we often talk about, let's say, uh, our boot time as a kind of problem in the automotive industry. And we're kind of curious if, um, if anyone else has these problems. <laughs> I mean, um, it would be kind of interesting to see basically what kind of solutions we could maybe try and co-develop together or see basically um, yeah, how we could basically, for example, get some uh, more patches into systemd uh, upstream, see how we could uh, replace, let's say, PolKit for our use cases for, for certain things. Uh, we'd be really interesting to kind of find out from, from you guys, let's say, what you are doing. And if you have, let's say, any ideas on things that um, we could collaborate on to basically try and make, let's say, generic user space for pretty standard Linux uh, a little bit faster. So yeah, please feel free to like come and talk to me. We also have um, our booth downstairs, uh, where we're showing basically the most of the ECUs in a kind of infotainment cluster of the new 7 series. Uh, so you can try it out a little bit yourself. Um, yeah, and if you have any ideas or things you think we could um, we could collaborate on, we'd be we'd be super interested. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for listening. Uh, <laughs> any questions or? So I think the question is around the um, yeah, Debian PolKit, which is not based on the JavaScript uh, MozJS stuff. So actually, we evaluated that as well. And actually, it is a bit better. It's not amazing, but it is, it is better. Um, the problem we see is that it's like kind of not really well maintained. And we kind of, let's say, not really too sure whether we should be using this kind of partly dead upstream. Um, it's a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it was one of the options, basically, uh, but we kind of decided that there wasn't really enough of an upstream to try and use this. Um, so, I mean, if you look at, like, how much code you need to basically do the really basic stuff that we need for, for a pole kit replacement, because we don't need, like, all of the stuff, like, where you ask the, the user, basically, like, whether he wants to authorize certain apps, things like this, right, which is much more complicated. We really just want a static config loaded once and then don't touch it again. Um, so you can actually do this with relatively small amount of code. Um, so you can be a bit faster, but yeah, it's another thing you can do that's, let's say, pretty cheap and easy. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, you can also use group check. It's just, it's also pretty much dead for the last like two and a half years, but it's actually fully working. Uh, yeah. Am I allowed a question during the stop or is that not allowed? All right. <laughs> I think you've already considered the separating boot section because the boot time really matters. Like it's running the high quality person. But the applications which need the best boot time, like the RBC application is the first boot, if it's a micro OS, then it puts everything else in the best way. Yes, the question is basically about putting certain applications basically in another OS with a hypervisor and then uh, loading basically your, your fat OS later. And I think this, let's say, typically something you can always do, right? I mean, um, it's basically what we try and avoid because it's then making, I think, two big problems. One, you have to maintain two systems. You also need a hypervisor. Um, it's typically is not entirely free, both performance and cost-wise. But also then you, you have this really awkward thing where you have to do a handover. Because the typical rear view cameras that we have when you have, so you have two kind of rear view cameras, right? You have the one that's really early for basically getting the two seconds, which is typically the pretty basic rear view camera that I hope most people don't see. Uh, and then you have this kind of like enhanced nice rear view camera with all the kind of bells and whistles. And if you show this really early one, and then you want to basically show kind of upgrade the customer to the nice one after the boot, you kind of need this kind of complex handover. And typically you end up, if you have to switch for OSs and you're switching everything, it's typically difficult to make this look really nice. Uh, and so optimizing, spending a lot of, let's say, time and money optimizing this basically, plus the extra OS, plus the hypervisor, typically difficult to argue for when you can essentially just try and make Linux as fast as possible just to get this problem out of the way. So specifically for the RBC, I think it's, yeah, you can of course do it this way. I think a lot of car makers are doing it this way. Uh, but we think with the kind of boot time we can achieve, it's kind of we can avoid it basically. And that's, I think, a better solution. Um, but yeah, if you have a hypervisor anywhere and you're doing things, it can work. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Then, thanks a lot.